Hey everybody, welcome inside the sit down. Ryan Mayer here alongside Tariq Azim, the founder of Empower out in San Francisco. It's a gym, Tariq, but you don't really like to call it a gym. It, it's, it's what encapsulates kind of a philosophy sure. for you. Sure. So just kind of take me through that a little bit and, and what the philosophy is behind Empower. Yeah, the philosophy behind Empower is primarily us honing in on key mental and emotional deficiencies that are preventing human maximization. You know, I think, um, I think there's nothing other than physical activity that exposes true character and human ability. And my mission with the Empower concept was to utilize physical activity to help conquer uh, internal peace, right? Um, utilize physical activity to um, recognize abilities. I use physical activity to be able to show correlative activities and exercises between, you know, life outside just the gym. Right. So we, we use uh, a series of different types of, 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 of physical activity and arts from the fundamentals of boxing and kickboxing and how that correlates into, into you know, emotional decision making versus, you know, step back and breathe and, and be thoughtful and measure the decision making because obviously you see the outcome of what happens yep. uh, if, you, if you try to box emotionally. <laughs> um, then you've got a flow program and we call it Empower Flow which is primarily based around utilizing the, 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 the influence of, of Jiu Jitsu and, and wrestling mm -hmm. and that's where we kind of coach the correlative activity of, of leverage and keeping your ace in your pocket until the time is right versus this emotional outburst and getting yourself submitted. Right. And then there's the next part, which is my favorite. It's primarily based around um, coaching humility. And how we do that is our strength and conditioning program. Uh, we're very, very big on preventative injury. So what we do is we, we, we keep it as, you know, close to 90% of our, of our strength and conditioning is around body weight mechanics. So, you know, if you can't lift your own body weight, then why add more? Right. And that usually humbles down a lot of, you know, very powerful people. Absolutely, <laughs> and you work with very powerful people, obviously NFL stars, uh, Khalil Mack among them, Marcus Peters, Marshawn Lynch, some of, uh, some of the most recognizable names out there. So when they're going through that type of program, the first time you're taking, it through, uh, taking them through that, what's it like for them? It's really neat, like uh, Doug Hendrickson is our, uh, our agent for our team, and every time someone comes in for the first time, he'll sit in front, him and CJ LeBoy, and I look at them and I do this little activity and I point to them, like just from watching them warm up, I'll usually say two or three, which means two or three minutes, mm -hmm. and they'll stop. And we do this little drill up and down our field turf, right. kind of going up and down, it's about 20 yards. And it, it's usually about two and a half to three minutes max where the body would just like, oh my God, I can't do this. Yeah. And then I just start yelling and, and joking, <laughs> like, it's just your body weight. Right, you know, right. I thought Why you is this so hard? What's right. going on? And then you see CJ and Doug just going nuts in the corner. <laughs> and then like, that's when I know I got them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now for you, your, your story and your background is so interesting to me. And I want to start first, obviously growing up uh, in San Francisco, you got into boxing, you got into soccer, into track as well. But you were really drawn more towards boxing and, and football, where you eventually went on to play in college. What drew you most to those sports in particular over some of the other ones, maybe? My insecurity mm -hmm. and my lack of confidence. I, the way I was, you know, I was seeking attention to be able to show like I'm valuable, I belong, right. I should be a part of. And, and obviously I had great coaches coming up and a great community around us. So I was getting that from them, but internally I just didn't feel like I was the guy, right? So I just wanted to do things a little different. And, you know, boxing and, and all that really began with um, my mother, actually. Um, when I was very young, got us into Taekwondo, and my hands were kind of going good in Taekwondo, and that's when we kind of went to the boxing. Um, but again, it was primarily about, I, I saw what it did for me and my confidence of just recognizing that I could think differently. It wasn't about, okay, I could fight, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. The, the neat thing about boxing, and, and then obviously football, was that there's so many different ways that you can get to a mission. Right. If something isn't working, you don't force it, right? Something isn't working, you kind of step back and you hit with a different angle. Yep. And very young, I was coached about that. And I started to apply what I was learning in martial arts and in, 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 in boxing and into uh, football, into my pass rush, into my position, into all these different types of things. And I just kind of, I never knew how to articulate what I was doing. Um, there was not necessarily language barrier, but just intellect, right? Right. And maturation. Right. But you know, at that time, I, I just had this edge uh, with my hands and my coordination and my feet. And I just saw how the two just worked hand in hand so good. And I never stopped training martial arts ever till this day, um, just because of how much it does for me with everything else in my life. Then on the football side, 
I was just wanted to go against cultural norms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, coming to the states as a refugee, yep. it was. I, I always said it was kind of difficult having goals and dreams, and it wasn't the, the personal component of it. It was about having support set up for it, and you know, having parents that don't expect that we're going to stay here in America for more than you know a year because the war is going to be. We're going to go back. No one really got invested in the American way. No one really got invested in understanding. You know the, the little things like building credit and mm -hmm. you know what are the processes for college applications and SATs and all these different types of things. But our parents were very big on report cards and grades. Right. Right. Of course. But there wasn't that other part set up. But we really didn't know what direction to go. Um, so, you know, football is what I thought would be that 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 tool and that opportunity for me to show that look, I want to disrupt like what our community's norms are and our community's norms was, you know, a bit of complacency and it was, you know, just play with the Afghans only and do this and then do that and I just said well no I want to I want to go do what the Americans are doing because right. I'm, I'm American now you know yeah and this is my home too and I want to contribute to like what makes you know this place America and it's just sports and it's football and it's baseball and it's all these different types of things that slowly started to get involved in and you know I had the privilege of moving on and, and, and playing division one football which is really big for myself and our community that no other I don't know if many other Afghan Americans got to play division one football at that time um, but for myself it was just it was it was cool to know that like I had the ability to disrupt yeah absolutely and from uh, from that perspective you talk about the ability to disrupt you had the chance to do that in Afghanistan yeah. with the way that not only did you start the women's boxing federation there but you also got some soccer going on the women's side as well, just uh, just from wanting to, as your family talks about all the time, lay the bricks mm. for others there. So just kind of take me through that a little bit and what drew you to going back to Afghanistan and staying there for the period that you did to try and build this up. Yeah, absolutely, like like many families who came here um, from, from Afghanistan, we all come from families we're really proud of. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I had two grandfathers, uh, both maternally and paternally, that uh, live in history books. You know, and they were really, really interesting people who were not normal. Right. And they made it very safe for me to grow up with not normal goals and dreams, hence American football and the fight game and, you know, all these really neat things I've been blessed to be a part of. Um, but growing up, our, our parents were relentless on making sure who we were and what we were and where we came from and, and don't be fooled by the situation that you live in. We didn't know any better. I felt like I lived a great life, right? right. But like looking back, you're like, man, we were in a tough situation. Like we, you know, we were on welfare, we were on housing, we were on food stamps and I used to like run out of the grocery stores when I knew my parents were paying food stamps because I was so embarrassed if anyone saw from school. And of course. So all that kind of stuff was always, you know, a bit of a struggle. But as you grow older, you get like this sense of appreciation for that, right? And there's, there's value for that. But again, when we got home, our parents made us feel like we were royalty, like we were billionaires like we had everything and it was really because of a, a legacy a family name and a family legacy and I was just so 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 fascinated with my grandfathers and their stories and I said look I really want to raise my flag in the world like they did and one of the biggest things was my fa grand maternal grandfather was a commanding jet fighter and, mm -hmm. and the first jet pilot of Afghanistan uh, brought the first Meg 21s over he's one of the biggest targets of the communist regime and my grandfather was taken from my mother um, when the communists had invaded, um, very cowardly, right? Asked to come in for questioning, and they never brought him back. Right. But one of the things he knew before he left uh, was that he was never coming back. And he told my mother and my grandmother, there's two promises you have to make me, and my spirit will never forgive, my soul will never forgive you if you don't honor. One was, don't ever turn your backs on Afghanistan. And two, don't ever come looking for me. So. In my head, my mom's always told me about this, don't turn your back on Afghanistan thing. And a lot of my mission my entire life of what really wanted to tackle these not normal, you know, things going on from joining ASB to sports to football to fighting to all these th different types of activities I was blessed to be a part of. My mission was always that I really want to help contribute to some sort of peace initiative in Afghanistan. And in 2004, I had that opportunity when my father had to go overseas uh, on some family things. and. And I was obviously in my last year of college ball, and I was in this position of like, look. Right. Debating your future. Debating really. my future. Like, look, you're so close. Like, why not go try a pro day and see if you can make it? Like, everyone else is signed up for it. You've got the athletic ability. You've come this far. Like, why not? And at that point, and at this point in my life, anything that's in my head that I decide to do is going to happen. And I've seen right. it time and time again. Like, you, you know that, right? And at that point, I was like, this is like teeter-totter of like ego 
or legacy? Right. <laughs> Ego or responsibility? Which is something we all struggle with yeah. in that respect. Yeah. And I, I decided that, that, you know, legacy is, is what's important because that was the fuel that got me to my education, that got me to this amazing community, that got me to running water, that got me right. to electricity. And uh, I decided to, you know, surprise my father and I went overseas to support him in this issue that he was dealing with. But when I got there, um, you know, I went there for, with an opposite intention. I went there for like a really bad intention of like just dealing with bad people and acting bad and doing all that with these, against these people. But when I got to that country, I actually got extremely humbled immediately seeing the circumstances, the situation, um, where I got extremely emotional when I got off the plane, like so emotional. And it wasn't because I was sad because of poverty or any of that, right? It was, it was primarily because I was just disgusted with myself that I've been blessed with so much and I'm coming here with right. this intention, right? right? And that's where I really started to create this relationship with intention, was in 04. And when I got there, I, I, my father's like, it's okay, things will be all right. And I was like, it's not the Afghanistan that I'm scared of. He's like, well, what is it? I said, I'm disgusted with myself because the intention came here. He, he said, well, you just figured out your purpose in this world. Mm -hmm. And he said that to me and I just kind of, we drove like 10 minutes and I realized, look, I've been blessed to understand the significance and the efficacy of sport and I'm going to help reconcile every issue in this country, reconcile peace throughout this entire country through sports. And almost immediately I just started with a little neighborhood program. And how I started the neighborhood program was that because of circumstances I was there for, my father said, listen, like, don't make any friends here unless they're 10 years old or younger. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> they're the only honest souls here at this, right. this, this, you know, this group of people in that country at that point. And it's not that the people are bad, but they just don't know any better. 30 mm -hmm. years of, of, of war and savagery. Yeah, it'll absolutely do that to right? a person. No education, no faith, no, no governance, nothing. It's, 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 a, it's you know, a few generations of just animals have been bred. Um, so immediately I made my little friends when I got to the neighborhood. They're all kind of waiting because I was, you know, Pocho Seb's son, <laughs> and they're all standing outside of the house with soccer balls because everybody knew I was a football player. Ah, uh, so they thought that the original football, correct, not the American correct. version. Correct. So I of got football. there and I just kind of laughed at this, and I said, "No, you little dummies! It's <laughs> American football." And right. then one kid goes, "Gao Jangi," which means cow fighting, because mm -hmm. that's what it looks like. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. But I grew up playing soccer, so it was it was, it was all good. And then I ended up just kind of turning around, hanging out for a few minutes, go upstairs, and then just like. They started showing up every day. So then we ended up doing like a two, three day a week thing just in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And then some of the girls in the neighborhood would let me be watching up from above and I'd like wave to come down and, and the kids would be like, you can't do that. You can't wave to come down. I'm like, well, why not? You know? And this is where I realized a lot of, of, of I think peace initiatives or any growth really doesn't move on in, in a place like Afghanistan because of the lack of something called communication. Right. And when this kid said, why not? And he couldn't, when I asked him why not, and he couldn't tell me why, I said, okay, uh, that's an opportunity. It's like, just how it's always been, correct. been done. Let's right. just not pursue anything. Yep. So I literally knocked on the door, went upstairs, and I said, hey, auntie, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm you know, this man's son. She's like, I know who you are. Welcome. Come on in for tea. I said, no, listen. I had a quick question. Your daughter's watching us play downstairs, and would it be okay if she came to join? And um, he, she like put her like scarf over her nose and I looked back at her husband. Her husband said, who is it? It's like, oh, it's Pocho Seb's son's here. Oh, come in for tea. Come. I was like, oh no, I'm actually playing a soccer practice. I'm sure with the boys, but your daughter is looking at us. And I told her to come down and play. And the guys got mad at me for asking her to play. And he's like, and I was like, would that be okay with you? And he looks back, he's like, will somebody please take this bag of potatoes downstairs and make her do something physical? <laughs> and I said, oh, you know, and that's where, like, that little tiny thing, like, it's a funny story and it's, like, so small. Right. But I, I was like, this is the story of this country. Yeah. Like, on all fronts. Absolutely. Like, it's not change, it's actually just opportunity, right? Like, these people are all feeding opportunity. They just have nobody that's, that's leading the charge or organizing or facilitating anything for them or communicating on their behalf. And it literally, like, you know, the girls started coming out to play, doing their thing, and then in parallel to this thing, like, we started building, like, a really big program, and it was happening quite a bit, where uh, a gentleman named Wali Sabruzada had started organizing a real women's program mm -hmm. um, with, with the Olympic Committee. And him and I had got connected, and, you know, not that I had anything to do with the building of that national program right. for women's program. He did all that himself. And then obviously later, a ton of support jumped on from all over, the, you know, the, the, all the Afghan Americans and Afghan Europeans around the world. 
but I was able to contribute quite a bit when it came to the coaching side of things and, and team development and, 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 and creating safe places by just com you know conversating and having these girls realize there's a responsibility that comes with being an athlete and all that. Um, and then that program got a lot of visibility with, uh, with the ESPYs and two of our girls were able to come to the, to the States and we we're all invited to the ESPY awards right. and claim being recipients of the Arthur Ashe awards because we were all there as a group. Um, but for me, that's when I looked at it and I was like, okay, my man, like, this is a sign that I can actually do something a lot bigger than this program. Not that the soccer program wasn't awesome, but it still wasn't telling the story of Afghanistan being ready for social change. Right. And I needed to do it in a way to where women would utilize a program that'll skyrocket them into do male dominated roles in society, mm -hmm. like parliament, like the military, like the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Defense and you know, entrepreneurship, but there was nothing out there that was defining enough for women to be able to be like, look, I'm a part of this, therefore I should be able to be in these male dominated roles. Absolutely. And that's when I created the Afghan Women's Boxing Federation. And it was a, it was a draw, it was a, it was a mission. But it literally just took communication. It took conversation. It took, it took, you know, the it took the ability of being able to like put your ego aside and agree to disagree, right? It wasn't about choosing sides and this like level of extremism that causes massive demise in these in these, these these countries. Mm -hmm. And it's happening all over the world now today, right? Like, yeah. it, it doesn't need to be like this if 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 people could just agree to disagree. And right. I was able to prove that firsthand when, you know, of all people. Um, you know, there's there's three groups that a lot of folks were terrified of for me doing this. And it was terrified for me mm -hmm. of like, you know, don't do this. You know, I mean, it was, it was really neat. Like peacekeeping groups were the one that were con trying to convince me to not do this. And locals and bad boys were the ones who were telling me to do this program. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, it makes sense to me. You know, like, <laughs> keep instability so we have a job, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and I, I went against that. And I ended up finding the individuals that were supposed to be barriers uh, to this thing, and they actually ended up being the biggest supporters, and which really helped again solidify the power of communication, um, the power of, of of acceptance and embracement mm -hmm. of what you're scared of, and you know these three different groups all teamed up individually and said that listen, this is the most symbolic initiative that's ever been presented. Two of them are considered like most notorious warlords. I call them tribal elders. <laughs> yep. And the other was an official from the Taliban regime, and Muhammad Mutawakkil. Mm -hmm. And he said to me that like there hasn't been a symbolic initiative presented to their regime like this, and he, and he said this on camera actually. Mm -hmm. and he said he said um, what you're doing is extremely symbolic, and know that I'd be I'm your first line of defense to making sure nothing happens to this program as long as the women obviously don't expose themselves and right. you know if you, let's right. follow They're, let's follow of course. Sharia law and the v real version of it, not what you know media puts out of, of what that means, but. It was really neat, and that program ended up being something that helped the confidence of the you know the six to eight girls that started with the program, knowing that we're not training to be fighters, we're not training to just be Olympians, we're not training to you know be in the UFC. Like, we're fighting for opportunity. We're fighting right. to prove to the world that Afghanistan is ready for social change by representing the most male-dominated activity known to mankind and the most male-dominated society of all time. Now, since you had the opportunity to start the program, you mentioned the six to eight girls that you really started with there. How much have you had the chance to talk back and forth with them since? Well, it's been a little while since I've um, been able to see them. They've all gotten a lot older now, you know, and things are a little different when they get older. Yep. So when they're, when they're, you know, 14 to 17, 14 to 18, you're big brother, mm -hmm. right? You're coach. Of course. 18 on, they become wives of other men. And it's it's really difficult to stay in contact and communicate with them at that point, but they did they did really well um, in the sense of you know becoming this 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 cohort that made it safe for 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 women to have you know dreams to mm -hmm. have goals to be able to be involved in really influential decision making, and the program grew tremendously. It turned into a national program. Yep as you know, and, and up until I was supportive of it and involved in it, uh, we had one gal um, in London and then I got pulled off last second um, for the Olympics. Um, and then the, the, we built boxing clubs throughout the entire country. So there's, the yeah, program's active. Um, and I just haven't been too involved with it in a couple of years um, since I came back to the States. And coming back to the States, uh, one of the things that when I was 
re reading about you and talking to a little bit to you before the before we got this started is you w wanted to continue to kind of lay that foundation here a mm. as well that you started sure. in Afghanistan. You've had the opportunity to do so with Empower, and you talk about the strength of communication and just. I think that's one of the most interesting things to me because these guys, these NFL guys that, that you've had the opportunity to train, they all look at you as a brother, mm. a, as someone that they can talk on the real with, not mm. just, you know, here's what I need, I need you to do a certain amount of sex. Sure, sure. So just what are those relationships like for you? Uh, they're just real, right? I, I'm, and obviously spending as much time as I did in Afghanistan, like initially when I went to Afghanistan in 04, I planned to be there for about a month and a half. It was a four and a half years. Yep. Right, like I learned a lot about, and what kept me addicted to being in Afghanistan was the fact that I felt valuable. Like I was, it was nice to feel valuable. And I said, like obviously reflecting on it, like what made me valuable in Afghanistan? Well, the cool thing in Afghanistan is that you can't be anything but honest there. Right. There's no playing games, like there's no room for that. There's no hustling, there's no, you know, being cute and backdooring, and it's just like, they read right through you, they've seen it all, right? And I learned, the, I learned the power, the influence, and the significance of truth. And I've always kind of, I felt had that, but out there it really took it to a different level when it came to building, right? Whether it be a c country, a city, a business, or yourself, mm -hmm. it's truth. And, and obviously putting that intention out, um, our creator really started to align me up with a lot of individuals that validated significance of truth. And one right off the bat was when I got back into the States, and, and kind of like try to stay as relevant as I could here were my teammates, uh, Jake Shields, yep. Josh McDonald, uh, Luke Rockholt, Gilbert Melendez, and, and Luke Stewart, and you know, these really a phenomenal martial artist that I just became teammates with, right, through training. And, you know, these individuals compete, and we all train really hard, and you really don't get to that depth of training and banging and fighting. Right without having some sort of self-awareness and uh, having confidence in, 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 in what you are, right? Because at the end of this, you're putting on the line. And as this stuff was going on in the fight game and Jake was competing and, and Josh and Gil and all of our friends and we're all training together and the fights were happening and these world titles were happening, um, started building a bit of a brand back in San Francisco that the story from Afghanistan has come to the fight game and here's what's happening. That the guy who coached women in Afghanistan is coaching Jake Shields and like really neat things, Tom Cable, who was the head coach of the Oakland Raiders at this time, mm -hmm. um, piqued some interest on like, who are these guys? Because Bruce Gradkowski, who was a quarterback there, um, started working out with me a little bit on like, hey, you know, is there anything we can do um, with what you've got going on with your training for fighting and boxing and strength and conditioning to help me with my quarterback, sure. my quarterbacking? So Bruce and I kind of started messing around and Charlie Fry was there at that time and I think they were making some improvements where Tom Cable was like, what's going on with these guys? Yeah. And they said, yeah. this guy from how's Afghanistan. This all happening? Right. You know, and Tom Cable came out to see me and we were actually training out of the garage and gym of my apartments in San Francisco is where our training program was for the guys back then. And, and he's looking through this window, coming in, you know, big guy, drives his truck into the city and he's staring and I wave at him to come inside. So he walks around and he's like, just kind of do your thing, I'm gonna stand in the corner right here. And right there I was like, this guy gets it. Mm -hmm. like, a head coach of a national football league, most humble human being to drive across the bay with his schedule, Right. To come see what an Afghan refugee is teaching his quarterbacks. He says, there's got to be something here. We had a dinner immediately following. Like, he saw what I was doing. And he's like, where do you apply this with the O-line? Where, where would you apply your philosophy with, with um, um, on the D-line? And pass rushing was kind of like my thing. And I'd show him how, the, how these all apply. And he was like, hmm. And it made sense to him. Right. So we ended up going to a dinner that night, hanging out for a few hours. Talked a lot about our philosophies and our perspective. And literally since that night, in 2008, 2009-ish, um, we shook hands that our responsibility to each other was to hold each other to our truths. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what's happened since. And I ended up opening up Empower um, because I, you know, I got to had the privilege of working with Caves at the Raiders and all the guys there. And then he went to Seattle and I was like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not leaving the Bay. Right. You know, I, I'm, this the is fight home. team's here, home's yep. here, I haven't been around, my parents. Um, and when I decided to, to you know, kind of like make that decision and do this thing. Tom Cable was my first friend in my corner. It was like, whatever it takes, you got me. You know, whatever we need to do to make this happen, you got me. So, I had jumped into my savings, Cabe's threw in some dough, and it was like, no, nah, the, the world has to feel what, what we're talking about. The right. world has to know what we're doing and what you're thinking. 
So I ended up opening up in power. Um, things started going really well, um, just because of like some of our you know background and our and our name, and um, and I just was like, there has to be a process to let people into this thing, and the process was that. You know, we talk about communication. Mm -hmm. um, nobody can be a client at Empower. No athlete, no individual, no organization, unless the principal, whether it be the athlete, the CEO, founder, um, or the in individual, they cannot walk through our doors without doing a game plan. And a game plan is my branded term for an honest conversation. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I've made a business off of just having honest conversations. And the reason I want that honest conversation is because I don't want the physical activity I'm going to put you through to not be maximized on and, 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 and to show you how all of these correlate to those right. key mental and emotional deficiencies that are preventing you from getting to that maximum state of contentment. So if I don't have that conversation with you, I'm not coaching you because I don't know what my responsibility is to you. And all mm -hmm. I want my responsibility to be to you at the end of the day is, as you read the title of Paul Kicks's article in that ESPN piece, I'm extremely conscious of death. Yeah. Because it's the only guarantee and the only real thing in this world. Right. So, you know, if I'm gonna have a responsibility to someone, someone's gonna take my time, and I'm gonna take their time, I want it to not be empty. I want it to mean something. And that honest conversation we have in our game plans are consistently what I just keep in your head and your ear about this is the state you need to be prepared for. What's this versus that? And it's like, oh my God, life's easy. I'm like, mm -hmm. of course it is. Given, you know, there are circumstances, obviously, with injuries and sickness and illness that are very, very sad. But I'm also a man who believes that there's nothing that will happen to us that our creator don't prepare us for. Right. You know? Um, so the communication is what really lowers the water line with my, my brothers. Yeah. Um, that make it safe for these individuals to feel and be because they don't have many safe places where they can be vulnerable. It's not used against them. Right. Right. And I think with our community and our little establishment, it's become a safe place for them to just feel like themselves and be okay feeling like themselves and being held to themselves. You know? Absolutely. And that's where the Dion Jordans and the, you know, Marshans, or I can't say Dion Jordans or Marshans because they're only one of a kind. Right. <laughs> right. The type of individuals that strive for the greatness these guys strive for, it's, it's extremely difficult to not support them, support them because it's not football, right. right? Football's a part of the journey of what these guys want to do before they take their last breath, and that's what I push for. And that's right. why we can't stop. That's why when people are like, oh, what are the metrics at this? And like, where are they at with this? And like, it doesn't matter. Right. Like, it's this big compared to what we're going after. That's why we don't market. It's hard to market what we do because <laughs> No, a absolutely, but, it, but it's such a, it's an interesting take and, and such a wholesome view of athletes that I don't think many people really see, right? Like we yeah. watch these guys perform on Sundays and we marvel at their athletic feats, but we don't know what's going on in their heads. So it's, it's always interesting to me to hear something like this where you're walking them through those yeah. fears that they have. Yeah, and it's actually embracing them through and, and educating how safe it is to not fight it. Right. Right? Like coming up in a household where, you know, my, my father, God bless his soul, he's in heaven now, but he, because of his lack of ability to communicate, right, whether it had been confidence and obviously language barriers, etc. not long before he passed, I realized my father wasn't legitimately as mentally ill as they made him be. Mm -hmm. It was the easiest way to deal with his emotions versus like doing what I do for a living. Right. Of just having someone to talk to and make it safe for you to feel the way you're feeling. So I think at the end of the day, our program really pulls out what I'm looking to push pretty aggressively this next year, which is a, a strong media play mm -hmm. around uh, a podcast and, and um, working on a book. Okay. And it's, um, it's, it's called The Human Side. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the whole goal is literally about pushing out the human side of things. Well, and, and that's the whole goal of, of that any of us have, being, right, is, is, being, to, yeah. is to find that human side of us and to be okay with yeah those fears that we have yeah. and with those strengths that we have. So I'm going to challenge you to one thing as your coach now. Okay. It's not that you're going to find it, it's that you're going to expose it because mm -hmm. you know exactly where it is, mm -hmm. right? It sits right on your heart. Right. And we just have to be safe and know that we can expose it. Right. I don't think we need to find confidence. I don't think we need to find anything. I think it's all there. Mm -hmm. We just got to expose it. Yeah, absolutely. So the final thing I want to ask you about is just San Francisco in general. Obviously, this is a city that you've seen 
throughout your life. Just what what is the biggest difference or what are the things that you love most about your city and your home? Um, <clears throat> it's uh, I have a very nomadic mentality, right? <laughs> Coming here as a refugee and mm -hmm. then having to travel and then school, etc. Um, I love San Francisco. I love the Bay. Um, just because of my memories and the opportunities it's, it's given me, right? Um, but I'm spending a lot of time in New York lately. It's coming <laughs> home. Um, San Francisco overall is awesome. I think it's awesome, but the, the culture and the community has changed tremendously. It's yeah. not original San Francisco culture anymore. I think it's gotten really soft. Um, and, I, I, and I'm not saying soft like people are weak, right. but I think we just don't stand for... Um, the same things. The same things that we used to, you know. And, and there's a lot of non-San Franciscans and non-Barians um, in San Francisco now making these decisions. So it's 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 a little strange because it's kind of tampered with the culture. Mm -hmm. But we do really good with with our uh, our little big kids playground out in Power of Heaven. A lot right. of the trying to uh, trying to bring lovers that. together. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Trying to bring that community just together. to have it keep it tight and just know where the root is. Um, but you know, obviously, we're looking forward to this next generation. I'm really, really excited about the youth. I think we have a, a very interesting time going on in, in, in the world and in the U.S. right now, mm -hmm. which is making um, a lot of our, our youth um, very motivated to, to create uh, better forms of communication, respect, etiquette, morals. Um, and I was almost losing hope. Right? With this, I'm like, oh, what are these kids going to think right, because right. of social, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, I'm grateful. I'm looking forward. I mean, the Bay Area families and the originals are working really hard on, on making sure these kids know, like, like, here's what we need to do to clean this whole thing up. And it just comes down to the fundamentals of education. Tariq Azim, founder of Empower. Tariq, thanks oh, so much for the time. Thank I you so much it. for having me. All of right, Of course. Man. Yeah. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.